I'm Brennan Lafferty, publisher of Sustainable Plastics and Plastics News. Welcome to Ask the Expert, our new live stream series. Now with Ask the Expert, this is your chance to engage with professionals to address the current business environment, to discuss new developments, and most importantly, to ask some questions. This week's topic is of vital importance, plastics recycling and the circular economy. We have four live streams scheduled this week dealing with supply chain collaboration, trends in technology, the recyclability of plastics, and reducing energy. Today's topic, trends, technologies, and jumping into the circular economy. Our expert today, Mr. Walter Ripple, Vice President Sustainability at Aviant. Now, Walter will answer your questions after his presentation, that said, you can submit a question at any time. To do so, email spevents at crane.com, or if you're watching this live stream on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, send your questions through those platforms. With that, I'll turn things over to Walter Ripple, Vice President Sustainability at Aviant. Take it away, Walter. Thank you, Brennan. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. You know, before I get started, in case you hadn't heard, um, Poly One has changed its name to Aviant as a result of our recent acquisition of Clarion Master Batch business. And together as Aviant, we'll drive advanced technologies to help customers reach their sustainability goals with advanced technologies and with speed to market. With that being said, I'm very excited to dive into a topic that's very near and dear to my heart, of course, which is sustainability. It's been my privilege to lead the sustainability efforts at Aviant Corporation for the last one and a half years or so. And it's of course a personal passion of mine. So I look forward to sharing some of the uh, perspective on sustainability we have and hopefully it will be insightful for you as well. Today I'll start out by defining sustainability just to get us all on the same page with that topic. And then I'll talk about macro trends and some of the implications of those and then take a little bit deeper dive into the circular economy and some of the solutions that we have to address it. So let's just dive right in. I'm asked so many times what the definition of sustainability is. It's a word that's used in so many contexts now. I personally still believe the best definition of sustainability that I've ever heard was the one that was way back in 1987 and developed by the United Nations Bruntlet Report. You've probably seen this many times before, but sustainability at that time was defined as meeting the needs of the present without compromising future generations' ability to meet theirs. It's a definition that stands today and for good reason. Another widely accepted tenet of sustainability is that there are three pillars, not just one, and that is that companies should have more purpose than profits alone, but also with environmental and social purpose as well. So let's just talk about some macro trends impacting our industry. There are many, and they're all interrelated in some form or fashion, of course, around protecting the planet. But there's been some real acceleration of these trends in the last five to 10 years, and certainly in the last few. And that's partly, if not much driven by social media, that's driving consumers to be more engaged and more aware than ever before. Who doesn't know Greta Thunberg, for example? And consumer behavior and expectations are changing. They're demanding action by OEMs or municipalities and governments to do something. And they're starting to take action. And certainly the perception of plastics has taken a hit in the last few years with uh, the images of plastics waste and rivers and oceans and also with marine life that has been harmed by, those, by, those, uh, by that waste. As an industry, we have to manage the balance between sharing this tremendous sustainability benefits that plastics offer, but while at the same time acknowledging plastics waste problem. 
And be clear, it's not a plastics problem. It's a plastics waste problem. But more importantly, what are we going to do about it? And I'm going to talk more about that throughout the presentation. What are the implications? Well, there's no question that there are trends that are putting pressure on companies throughout the value chain to be more sustainable and to look more internally on how you can better operate your business to achieve these standards. Let's just look at a few of these implications in a, a little bit more detail on the next few slides. First, it's time to prioritize sustainability if you want to prosper over time. Many of our stakeholders, now more and more driven by the consumer, want to do business with environmentally and socially conscious suppliers. It's about reputation for sure, but it's also about reduced costs, greater efficiency, and a richer value proposition by the supplier. And certainly part of that is managing your natural resources. Second, the time is now. You know, I hate to use the cliche, but it's either get on the bus or you're going to miss the party. Consumers are demanding this. OEMs are listening to the consumers. So anyone who serves OEM customers or in that value chain needs to listen to. And make no mistake, our investors are expecting it as well. Next, transparency is key. For years, B2B manufacturing has operated in stealth mode, especially around environmental and social factors. The expectations, though, are that you will be transparent about your operations and how they impact the environment. Many of your customers are doing this already, and they're probably asking you that you do the same. They want to be able to ensure their customers that their suppliers are also on track with these objectives. Here's another reason why the time for sustainability is now. It will be increasingly difficult to hire talented associates without a strong sustainability program in place. Corporate social res responsibility is now table stakes for most younger adults who are seeking an employer. And now more than ever, consumers are also taking notice of how companies treat their associates. And all you have to do is watch social media to see how you're doing. And finally, sustainability is truly the long game. It involves investing now to reap the benefits later. And that means rethinking some of the foundational elements of your business and putting the proper management systems in place and measurement systems to ensure steady progress. But it will be critical for your long-term survival to find ways to do both sustainability and profitability. And those two efforts don't have to be mutually exclusive. Now let's switch gears for a minute and talk about the circular economy. In summary, the circular economy is an economic system that minimizes waste and uses natural resources wisely. You may have seen this make, use, recycle graphic before. It's definitely made its rounds. Um, it represents the idea of keeping products and materials in use over and over again and minimizing waste or even maximizing value over time. And this is opposed to our current economy, which would be called linear, which is often referred to as take, make, and dispose. So this is definitely a great goal, no question about it. And many companies and OEMs have made commitments in alignment with the circular economy. But how are we doing? Let me answer that question with a question. What would you guess is the percent of plastics waste recycled annually on a global scale? I'm gonna pause a few seconds as, as you uh, ponder that subject, but you know, just remember to keep in mind while you're thinking about this, that not all regions, not all countries around the world have the same infrastructure or sophisticated systems in place as some potentially in, for example, the, the Western hemisphere. The answer is, it's estimated that only 9% of plastics waste is recycled on a global basis. So there's a lot of work to be done for sure. This is certainly the reason why single-use plastics are getting such a bad rap. Why is the number so low? Well, first of all, collecting and sorting plastics is still difficult. We have to make throwing recycle into the right bin as easy as throwing waste into the waste bin. There's also a performance issue with some recycled plastics. With each his history, properties tend to degrade without some type of technological intervention or processing intervention. And finally, recycled materials are more expensive because they just simply cost more to produce. So as an industry, we need to work together to solve this challenge of our times. 
Certainly one way to do that is through partnerships and alliances that are aimed at solving the plastics waste problem. One example is the Alliance to End Plastics Waste. Now it so happens that Aviant was a founding member of the Alliance to End Plastics Waste about a year and a half ago. Um, and this is a consortium of, of companies across the value chain who are committed to investing one and a half billion dollars over the next five years to end plastics waste. And I know there are many other organizations out there as well. Another, of course, is through new technology solutions, like I'm going to show on the next page. At Aviant, we've developed a number of solutions that enable our customers' circular economy goals in terms of improved recyclability and also using less materials. And that's from additives that allow more recycled content into a package or toners or scavengers that mask the off-color tint or the odor of recycled materials in a package. Also to viscosity builders that help to improve the amount of recycled PET that can be kept in the recycle stream by improving the mechanical properties and the molecular weight. Also to additives that help to reduce the wall thickness of a package so that you can use less packet of plastic in a package in the first place just to name a few. Now, recycling though, isn't the only answer. We're also working with customers to meet the broader challenges of sustainability. And we've categorized those solutions in the eight ways that we enable our customers to do just that. In addition to the ones I've already mentioned, we're also working toward making plastics lighter or lightweight. And that's typically versus heavier materials like metals or glasses glass, um, which helps to improve fuel efficiency for combustion energy or transportation costs or even battery life in, in electric vehicles, or lowering the energy that's required for our customers to make their parts, or in caper, incorporating more renewable or bio content in their plastics, or also enabling renewable energy, just to name a few more examples. And I know there are many others out there on the market. So I just want to end by saying, you know, I I think that our industry really has the ability to flip the script on plastics and sustainability. We can promote the tremendous sustainable value of plastics while banding together to solve the plastics, plastics waste problem. Through partnerships and technology advances, we really can make a difference for a more sustainable world. So I wanna thank you very much for your time. And with that, we'll open the floor for questions. Awesome. Well, thank you, Walter. Uh, great, great presentation. Uh, we do have questions coming in. Uh, we're going to get to those right now. But first, a reminder, if you weren't here at the top of the show, uh, to submit a question to Walter, you can email spevents at crane.com. Or if you're watching the live stream on Facebook, LinkedIn, or YouTube, send the questions through those platforms. So, uh, Walter, first question here. Um, as you delve deeper into the topic of plastics and the environment, what are you learning? What's Aviant learning? Oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I've, I've uh, been in the industry for, um, well, let's just leave it at over 25 years. Um, <laughs> and I think back to that time and what we were doing uh, with plastics and what the value of plastics were at the time. Now, the word sustainability wasn't coming up for sure. Um, but the real growth platform for plastics at that time was to lightweight products, um, make products safer, um, cheaper to transport, for example, replacing um, glass. Um, and so we also, we also made products, uh, if you think about dropping a glass uh, as opposed to dropping a plastic bottle, you know, one would break and, and cause some issues. And there were hospitals that, that wanted to be more safe in terms of surgical procedures, et cetera. So, I guess what I'm saying is, is that much of the growth of plastics has really been because they're sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, so as I look back at that, at, at that perspective um, now, um, you know, the thing that hasn't happened though, is that infrastructure is not kept up to be able to recycle those plastics as, as that growth has, has uh, really accelerated in the last decade or so. Um, and so, you know, that was one of the reasons I mentioned earlier, the Alliance and Plastics Waste um, that was one of the reasons we were a founding member of that organization, because, um, you know, they recognize uh, the alliance recognizes the fact that we need to band together across the value chain. In this particular case, we have all the way from polymer and additive, additive suppliers like ourselves or Dow Chemical or, or Lionel Bissell, for example, all the way to brand owners like P&G and PepsiCo um, and, and everyone in between. Um, 
all dedicated to solving one problem, and that's plastics waste. Again, investing a lot of money towards innovation, the infrastructure that is needed, and that's really important, uh, as well as education and cleanup. That's interesting. I didn't realize infrastructure improvements were part of the, uh, the mandate for the uh, alliance. Absolutely. And that will probably be a pretty large component of their investment. Yeah, certainly is needed here in the, in the States. That's for sure. Uh, OK, Walter, another question that's come in. Uh, can you tell me a little bit more about how Avian is supporting the shift to a circular economy? Sure, absolutely. Um, and I mentioned a couple of the solutions a little bit earlier, but, you know, we really do try to take a holistic approach um, in trying to understand what our customers needs are around sustainability in general, but also around um, circular economy. And, um, you know, it's not always easy to incorporate um, enough recycled plastics to get to some of the goals that our um, a lot of OEMs out there have committed to, to be uh, have all of their products be recyclable. For example, if you look at the Ellen MacArthur Foundation um, commitments, 25% uh, uh, recycle content up to 30. I've even seen some talk about 50% recycle content. That's not very easy to do, and it's not one solution. There's not one product that can make that happen. So we work with our customers to try to understand, are they trying to get plastics out? Are they trying to put more uh, content in there? Are they trying to get a clearer uh, material? Uh, are they trying to improve the mechanical properties? And we have solutions for all of those. And many times it takes a number of those solutions to actually solve the ultimate problem, including some of the both the design and the processing help that we can provide them. So, you know, certainly I'd be happy to share a lot more detail about that if anyone has questions about that um, after the call. Very good. All right, uh, we have our first question uh, in from YouTube. So okay. it, it's, uh, it's about the flexible packaging. Uh, the question is, what is the most efficient way to engage the entire supply chain to effectively achieve recyclability in flexible packaging? Any thoughts on that, Walter? Well, absolutely. I think that one's certainly uh, one of the, the more challenging, uh, I think, recycles, uh, challenges that we have. Um, because there's many times uh, multiple materials. And, and I, I think embedded in that question is actually part of the answer. This is going to take the supply chain coming together to figure this out, all the way from the, the waste management companies um, to the polymer suppliers, to the folks that are putting this all together in the design firms to figure out how do we reduce the number of, of materials that are going in or make them more compatible while still being able to uh, manage the mechanical properties that all, are all needed. Um, there obviously isn't a solution to that right now, um, but, but there are a lot of people that are working on that. But you really have to take all of those aspects into account, both design, uh, the amount of plastics, uh, the type of plastics and how they all interact together and how um, at the end of the day it can be recycled from the infrastructure that we have now or in the future. Yeah, couldn't agree with you more. There's so many factors that go into this. Uh, we were looking at a um, shampoo bottle yesterday uh, on Monday that was. Uh, made of virgin material and it was white. Now it's made of recycled material and it's black. Um, so yeah, design, as you said, goes into it, uh, the availability of material. Um, so here's a question. I think you went over this, but if, if someone's asking, and this was sent in through email, so thank you. Uh, if someone's asking, I think we might need a little more uh, pointed comment on this. Uh, Walter, what could be the value proposition um, if costs are higher, apart from being greener? I think the, uh, you know, wh why, why a move towards more sustainable materials if the costs are higher? What are the other advantages? Well, I mean, at the end of the day, it's all about protecting our planet, right? And, um, you know, as I had talked about earlier, I think that's really been one of the big shifts um, from, a, from a macro trend standpoint is um, around uh, consumer behavior and, and what they know about and the action that they want to take. So, um, part of that, one part of that, of course, is making sure that we're not putting any waste into the environment, including, of course, plastics waste. Um, and plastics waste, uh, because it floats, is, is very visible. Um, and so, you know, I think it, it has now become on, almost, if you will, synonymous with, uh, with climate issues and, and, um, and just simply protecting the environment. So I think consumers are now driving it. I think that's what's different. 
I would say even looking only 10 years ago, um, there was a, a small push towards, hey, let's do have green stuff. And I think a lot of companies came up with stuff that was that was green. Um, but at the end of the day, that wasn't really the consumer that was pushing that. That's what has changed. The consumer is pushing. The consumer are going to these OEM brands and saying, look, I'm not going to buy your product unless you can tell me that it's not going to hurt the environment, that you're going to recycle it. And um, some some OEMs have and, and consumer brands have actually begun to take it a step further and say, this is what our carbon footprint is, which is pretty amazing. As more and more companies do that and, and uh, consumer companies do that, it's going to drive even more awareness. And then the consumer are going to ask the next customer and the next customer to do the exact same thing. So I think it, uh, the, the difference now is that uh, consumers are asking for it and driving it. And I think they're ultimately going to be willing to pay a little bit more to do things that are helping the environment or at least not hurting it. Right. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, yeah, 10 years ago, that's probably the right number. Yeah, there was a, a small group of folks who were you know, making some noise on the consumer front. Now that voice is amplified. Um, Absolutely. So. All right, uh, so back to the macro. Uh, in your opinion, Walter, what is the biggest recycling challenge or obstacle we are facing today? You know, I think that um, it's kind of combined. Um, I think collection and sorting is one of our biggest issues, but part of that is the education so that you can do better collection. Um, so, you know, I, I gave an example earlier. There's a moment of truth by almost everybody every single day. Um, when you finish using a product that's in, that's in a plastic packaging of what am I gonna do with this? Am I going to throw it in this bin or am I going to throw it in that bin? Mm -hmm. And, you know, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, is that we need to make that decision process as easy to throw in a recycle bin as it is to throw in the waste bin. Um, and we're not there yet. If anything, it's very confusing. Um, so I think combined, there's a there's an education effort that has to go on. Um you know, maybe we need to look at our at our system of, of how we label and what is actually recycled um, and make it very easy and, and clean if we don't ultimately go to even a single recycle uh, uh, type of, of process that then is sorted out later on. I think if we can combine education with uh, a better collection process um, and then being able to sort it, I think that that'll make a huge improvement in, in the recycle content that we have now. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. That education piece um, never stops either, does it? It's uh, it's you know as as people age and as the next generation comes up, these these uh, messages need to be stated over and over again. Agreed. Yeah. All right, Walter. We're back to YouTube. Um, <laughs> when engaging your plastic supplier, how do you envision getting over the challenge of suppliers guarding their information to protect their own IP? and prevent customers bypassing them? Well, you know, I, I think that's, it's a good question, obviously. And um, I, I certainly understand why suppliers don't want to, you know, share all of their, their secrets or secret sauce, if you will. Right. Um, but at the end of the day, I just think that it's gonna take collaboration between um, the, the entire value chain to make this happen. Um, you know, I can tell you again, uh, not to talk the entire day about the Alliance in Plastics Waste, but I think there's some really good practices there. Um, we've been able to come together as this consortium, again, across the value chain and be able to push um, activities forward without having to actually share every bit of, of um, everyone's proprietary information, which, you know, naturally they don't want to do. But I think you have to form partnerships. Um, you have to develop uh, credibility and, and have some specific projects to go after. And hopefully they'll be willing to talk to you a little bit more about that. There's no question. That's a, that's a very good question because that is a challenge. And it is something that uh, I think all of us in this, um, I think that all of us in this industry really have to understand and, and, um, and make sure that we're pushing things forward. Yeah. And you, and you may have touched on this earlier. You know, I think um, transparency is important. Um, you know, as we as we work together to solve this problem. So I'm sure that that would be a part of the solution as well. Absolutely. And, you know, that that's both in terms of 
uh, product design, of mm -hmm. course, and product innovation, because obviously as you bring people to, together, uh, companies together, we're going to be able to move faster. But but it, it's also becoming more and more about what you're doing from an environmental standpoint. It's also, uh, and, and this is maybe a little bit newer, but, but it's really accelerating now. It's also being transparent about what you're doing from a social impact as, as well. Um, and that's, you know, engaging your stakeholders in your communities. What are you doing uh, with and for your associates? Are you a great place to work? Do, do, you, do people keep coming back? Do you have a good um, uh, diversity and inclusion record? All of those types of things. And that's going to be coming more and more, uh, I think, a topic for um, if, a, if a customer wants to buy from you um, and if an investor wants to invest in you for that matter as well. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a it's an old adage. And I think it's true. You know, people buy from people they like. And so if if you're buying from someone who's fulfilled and happy at a company, that's only going to help you in the long run. It's difficult to measure at times, but it's a good thing for sure. Yes, I agree. All right. An email question, Walter, um, at spevents at crane dot com. Uh, do you find OEMs pushing for third party testing or confirmation that products are truly sustainable? That's an interesting question. Um, I have seen it. Uh, I'll, I'll say that it, it isn't um, necessarily prevalent yet, at least from that's just from my experience. Um, I think over time, as we move more and more to standards, um, that that may be becoming more and more. Certainly, on the climate change standpoint, you know, obviously there's the uh, the, the TCFD um, and the um, SASB organizations um, that that are requesting more and more disclosures around climate change. And but in, in terms of the the TCFD, they are asking that you do get third party um, certifications. Um, I'm seeing it more and more, uh, but I wouldn't say that it's prevalent yet for us. Um, I, I think it is. Because I think companies are trying to make sure and and uh, it's really, again, being driven by the consumer that that companies aren't greenwashing. I think more and more over time uh, that will be something that you have to do is get some type of certification to to prove different aspects of sustainability. Absolutely. I think that will happen. Yeah, I know that used to be a little more prevalent. I don't know if they're still out there. Those those companies and those, you know, kind of a good housing, good housekeeping seal of a right as, as you were. Era. Right, and there actually there are quite a few of those out, out there now, but it's on very specific topics, as as what I've seen. Yeah, fair. Um, so interesting. I've been talking to executives all across the country and the world about COVID. You know, I think we're all talking about that every day. So uh, how it relates to sustainability, though. Here comes a question: In um, have you seen an impact on companies' commitments to to sustainability in light of COVID nineteen, or have people companies kind of you know, steady as she goes, maintain the course. What's your thought? I think, um, you know, as I think back to uh, the March timeframe, at least here in the United States, when when um, the pandemic was really kicking off, um, I'll have to admit, I was just wondering what what's going to happen with this message? Because prior prior to that, it just seems like uh, the message was really uh, feverish on um, mm -hmm. plastics is bad, no matter what. Um, but I didn't really hear a lot, and I, I suppose probably most didn't either, for for obvious reason. Because for a month and a half or so, there were there were bigger fish that were being fried out there. But um, so I wondered at that time. But I would say a month and a half or so, maybe two months in, I feel like the the conversation came back. But I also feel like the conversation was very different now, um, because I think that you know the consumer and others were really starting to see some of the value of plastics um, in the time of a pandemic, you know, both from, you know, face masks and, and face shields and breathing machines and ventilators and um, so many other things that were now disposable so that you didn't transmit the virus or any other uh, negative impacts, mm -hmm. um, you know, just to name a few of those. And now the conversation still is, well, okay, we, the, the, you know, we, we know that we need to have those products. We see the value of that. But guess what? That means there's going to be more of this stuff that's going to waste if we don't do something about it. So I feel like that is now uh, really the conversation that I think folks understand the value of plastics, the safety aspect, health and safety, et cetera. But at the same time, I think they understand that um, this we if we're going to keep that stuff, then we need 
to accelerate our efforts to get the right technologies to drive more recyclability. Yeah, I think that's a great answer. Yeah, I think we had to we had to level set, kind of go into the Maslow's hierarchy of needs and just exactly. Like, uh, but yeah, and then plastics is like, my God, thank God th these these products exist. And uh, yeah, so I think the next step is coming. You know, can some of these products be sustainable as well that we're using right. so readily now? All right, boy, oh boy, uh, Walter, you've you've touched a nerve here. We got so many questions. Um, how does Aviant support renewable energy? Is that is that part of uh, you know your mandate as a sustainability uh, VP? Absolutely, absolutely, Bo both internally and also externally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we we are. Uh, you know, we have invested in um, both solar and wind um, applications at our actual sites around the world. Um, but we're also um, accessing other renewable energy um, through different types of, of agreements that we have in place. Um, so this operationally, we're making sure that we do that. But we're also supporting our customers with different types of technologies to help to support uh, solar farms, um, wind fields and, uh, and other renewable applications like that. Um, so just as an example, um, you know, we help to manage energy in solar farm fields with, uh, with different types of wire and cable um, solutions. Um, we also provide different types of additives and uh, master batches that help to enable the infra both that infrastructure, but um, also in, um, in wind farms. Um, we've looked at replacing metal uh, or have developed solutions for replacing metal in even the, the wind blades. Uh, so we've actually done a lot of work in this area. And uh, I know that it's been a, a really strong growth area for us. Amazing. Yeah. <clears throat> the applications for plastics uh, are seemingly endless. endless. Um, they are. Yeah. So, OK. Uh, short and sweet question. Uh, Walter, do you have an opinion on this? Uh, do you have a preference, chemical versus mechanical recycling? Oh, well, you know, I don't know if you can answer that straight out because, um, you know, in, in some cases, mechanical, at least with technologies today, uh, don't work. Um, going back to the question earlier on in, in the uh, discussion is, you know, when you have materials which are uh, that require many different layers or at least multiple layers or disparate materials that just don't act well together in, in a normal recycling process. You know, that's one thing that uh, advanced chemical recycling helps with. And there's some real major advancements going on in that area right now, certainly a lot on the smaller scale. And many of those, there, there are a number of them now that are uh, being scaled up around the world. Uh, right now, but not not only does it take disparate materials and, and back it down to the different molecules, but it also takes any you know different types of uh, fillers or colors or anything like that out of the system. So, I think it, to answer it simply, I would say where we can do it mechanically, I, I think I would prefer that. But mm -hmm. in the cases where we can't, there are solutions that are being developed right now, really high tech solutions um, that could move us towards getting closer to 100% recyclability. And that, that is the goal for sure. Well, uh, to all of our viewers out there, thank you so much for all the questions. Uh, we did not get to all of them. Uh, we're going to make sure Walter sees them all, though, and he can uh, reach out and answer them uh, for you individually. So, Walter, uh, any parting thoughts or something you'd like to leave the viewers with? Well, first of all, thank you. Um, and thanks, everyone, for uh, for joining today. You know, I I really do think that venues like these that are bringing our industry together up and down the value chain um, to help us learn from each other um, is exactly what it's going to take to help to accelerate our industry's move towards sustainability. So I um, really appreciate this this opportunity. Um, I really do feel like our industry is going in the right direction now. I just gave you a few examples today, um, but we really do have to accelerate our efforts. And, you know, I also gave you a couple of examples in ways that we can do that. So, you know, finally, if you have any for further questions about any of the topics we discussed today or any of the products that I talked about earlier, please uh, don't hesitate to contact us given the information there on the screen. So thank you all very, very much. Awesome. Well, wonderful job, Walter. Again, thanks for sharing your insights. As he just said, if you want to reach out to Walter, you can email him at the address on the screen. He'll, he'll get back to you, I'm sure. Uh, my thanks to Walter Ripple, Vice President Sustainability at Aviant. My thanks to you for joining us today for Ask the Expert. 
Our Plastics Recycling and Circular Economy series continues tomorrow, Thursday, at 10 a.m. Eastern in the States, 4 p.m. Central European time. Our topic tomorrow, plastic packaging recyclability and how to assess it. Our expert will be Paolo Gliren, chairman of Resi Class. Tomorrow's sponsor, Tag Leaf Industries. Until then, have a great day. I'm Brennan Lafferty. Thanks for watching Ask the Expert with Sustainable Plastics and Plastics News. Don't go anywhere. Stay tuned for a message from Aviant.